Alrighty, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for taking time out of your day to come and listen to this presentation or watching this later, whatever the case might be. I, I appreciate it. Uh, my name is Cameron Aris, or Cam. Everyone around here calls me Cam. I'm pretty comfortable with that. I am an occupational therapist here at BCH, and I specialize specifically in rehabbing and treating the hand at the upper extremity. So um, when they asked me to give kind of a community education, a talk about what, I, what it is that I think that would be beneficial or important to touch on, I immediately thought of this kind of topic. And while it's beneficial for arthritis and for stiff hands and things like this, um, it is something that anybody in any generation can benefit from. So um, I knew immediately that this was a big line item. I talk about it with nearly all of my patients. And so I wanted to really dive deep a little bit into it, take a little bit more time than I usually get to in my sessions. Uh, so here we go. I have a, a phone number here for our scheduling line. If this presentation is something that is interesting and something that you think you would like to have an evaluation or see me for, please feel free to give that phone number a call. Um, just know I am an occupational therapist. So if there is a prescription that needs to be written, uh, make sure it says OT and not uh, PT. So a little bit of a discrepancy there. Uh, a lot of hand therapists are occupational therapists and not very many PTs touch it. I'm not sure why, but that's just kind of how it all happened. So um, with that said, let's go ahead and kick off here. I have a couple of uh, line items to talk about first. So we'll be here for somewhere between 30 to 40 minutes, probably about 35 minutes. Um, I'll give my my presentation and then following that we'll open the floor to a little bit of a Q&A session to ask questions there is a Q&A icon somewhere on your screen mine's at the top it might be at the bottom there's two little word bubbles there that you can type a question into um, there's a deceptively a chat option but that is not functional so try not to type anything in the chat you won't be able to go to that Q&A and also do be aware that other people viewing this are gonna be able to see that question and answer here. So uh, try and keep any sensitive or personal information out of there, uh, any contact, personal contact information, just uh, type the question there and we'll be sure to answer the questions as they come in um, or at the end of the session. This presentation is gonna be recorded. And so there's gonna be two different locations that you can find this. One is gonna be on YouTube and then the other location is going to be at this link here, which you'll have the link to access later on as well. Just click that link. It'll drop you right into uh, the website here at BCH for this presentation. It'll also have some other videos that I think are helpful for people to be able to access as well. Um, it'll be posted probably you know, within 24 hours, I would say at the latest, probably Friday morning, just to be on the safe side, but it should be up here pretty quickly. We've got a pretty good team and they're on top of it. So it should be posted pretty quick. And uh, along with the recorded presentation, you'll also have um, access to the slides. So you'll have that information as well. Here we go. So we're going to start off by talking about joint protection. And this is a really popular term, a really popular um, phenomenon in hand and upper extremity therapy. Sometimes it's called ergonomic principles. So don't be fooled. If you go forward and someone's talking about ergonomic principles, these two things are synonymous with one another. They mean the same thing. So I think they're just kind of progressing and, and updating some terminology in the field. And these two things mean the same thing. But when we're talking about joint protection, what we're really talking about is how to effectively and efficiently and safely position our hands and our wrists and our arms in the best way possible when we're going about our daily life, whether it's during a specific task or an activity or when we're using a specific kind of tool. Um, we want to be the most energy efficient and, and operating in a way that is the least painful for us. And, Usually we use our hands in ways that we're not aware of being hard on our arms and our wrists and our hands. And so we're just drawing our attention to that and focusing on some of those things that we might be able to change to make our daily life a little bit different, a little bit easier. 
Um, ultimately, what we're trying to do is reprogram the ways that we've always done something to have it be more efficient. Uh, in human development and in biomechanics, we often say that if we watch a toddler do something, they do it in the most biomechanically appropriate way possible. They're kind of our models of how we should be doing things. But as we get older, we develop ways of being a little bit lazy, a little bit quicker, a little bit faster. And that doesn't always mean that it's the best for our joints and our soft tissues and our bones. So it is a behavioral thing. It's drawing attention to something. It might not be the fastest way to do something, but long-term it is gonna save us from developing these kind of chronic conditions, whether it's arthritis, whether it's tendonitis, uh, whether it's carpal tunnel, it's gonna postpone our development of some of these things uh, to happen a little bit later than we would hope for really. When we talk about joint protection, there are some cardinal rules that we want to keep in mind as often as possible. The first and the most important one is we have to respect the pain. So the old adage of no pain, no gain, really we don't, in, in any kind of therapy, that's gone by the wayside. And specifically in hand and upper extremity therapy, we have so much neural connection in our hands and we have so much real estate in our brains dedicated to our hands that if we're constantly pushing into that pain threshold we run the risk of developing uh, you know pain conditions and pain disorders and perpetuating a pain cycle that we want to really avoid so while pain is uh, a good thing it is signaling to our bodies that something is wrong, that we're using something wrong, that we should draw our attention to the task or the activity at hand and make a quick modification. We wanna be aware of that. And I often tell my patients, we wanna distinguish between discomfort and pain because discomfort is that area where it might not be something that we like and we may be thinking, oh gosh, I don't really like how this feels, but I can tolerate it that's an okay range to be in. Um, and that's often where we work in, uh, in therapy together. But then there's that brink of this is uncomfortable to this is sharp, this is unrelenting, this is severe pain. And that's your body telling you that something's gotta change here. We can't be doing this all of the time. So we, we wanna be aware of that. The next rule that we have is that we want to incorporate and recruit larger muscles and larger joints to do the heavier lifting for us or just that repetitive lifting for us instead of relying on our hands and our fingers. Oftentimes we'll look at how can we ad adapt a task or an activity or the equipment to make our lives a little bit easier. Um, all of these bullet points we're going to discuss and dissect deeper as we go forward, but there's, if there's a way that's problematic or painful, there's surely a way that we can modify it with how we're holding it. Uh, can we build up a handle on our uh, gardening utensils? Can we maybe flip our grip uh, on a way that we can make it easier and using a bigger muscle to accomplish that task or that activity? So there's plenty of ways to adapt and a lot of resources out there to find good Good strategies and adaptive equipment to make everyday participation much smoother. Um, two hands are always better than one. So if we can disperse a load or a force between two bigger our two arms, for example, rather than focalizing it to our fingers or our wrist, that's much better and much more effective. And then the other thing, palms up or palms in, lifting, handling, carrying, pushing, pulling, any of that stuff, always better than using the palms down. That palms down position really, really is one of those precursors, not only for things like arthritis, but things like Decker veins, that, ten that tendonitis on that thumb side of our wrist, or extensor tendonitis on the back of our wrist, or trigger fingers even. So. I put this picture here to the right. It's a little bit grainy, but you can kind of see that she, this individual is carrying those bags in a hook grip, kind of in the fingertips. And that's definitely concentrating a lot of pressure on these tiny little tissues that we want to put somewhere else. 
I wanted to include a couple of helpful links that I often steer people to. OXO is actually a Shark Tank brand, a business company that the founder created because he had a loved one with arthritis in their hands and they had a hard time using everyday utensils, specifically kitchen equipment. So this brand is very popular. It's in Bed Bath & Beyond, Target, King Supers, it's everywhere. And what's special about it is that it builds up the handles for utensils, um, pizza cutters, you name it, they have an adaptive piece for it. And they put a lot of work into making that aesthetically pleasing as well. So you're getting good quality equipment and it's not standing out as some sore thumb in your kitchen. Because at the end of the day, we all kind of care about what we put in our kitchen. We have an eye for that stuff. Um, and it's really important. You know, the closed fist, this closed tight fist is really hard to operate with. If specifically for things like arthritis, it's hard to get around tiny or smaller devices. And this uh, website has a ton of different built up handles much bigger, much easier, much more efficient to get our hands around and to use and put enough force in to be effective and to help us just go about day to day a lot easier. E-Special Needs, this is kind of a catch-all website. They have a ton of information and a ton of different things for all, all sorts of things. There's a lot of pediatric stuff on this website, but there are several items on here that I like a lot. Um, and they have things really beneficial for like dressing, self-dressing, shoe tying, adaptive shoelaces. Um, this is a, a really rich source of resources for folks. And so I would encourage people to just take a look at it um, and spend some time sifting through. There's a ton uh, on that website that I think can be really helpful and beneficial for a variety of different needs. And then this living with arthritis blog, this centers a little bit more around knitting, needlepoint and crafting. I have a lot of people come in and, and that's a valued leisure uh, activity for them. And I don't have any experience myself in needlepoint or knitting. And so it, it can be hard for me sometimes to relate to people with those kinds of goals. But this is a really helpful blog uh, made and it, it answers a lot of questions. Um, and it offers a lot of alternatives and a lot of adaptive strategies to like build up handles on crochet needles or, or lots of different strategies that people have done and found successful that they are living with arthritis and they've found a way to go about making life a little bit easier to continue to do the things that they love to do. So I encourage people to check out this kind of resource as well. This slide is a little bit busy, but I wanted to kind of show this is nothing in compared to the amount of resources and adaptive equipment that people can have, but I wanted to just quickly show what is out there and how these things look. So from the top left, and we're not going to go through all of these, but from the top left, uh, I think is a great example because we're all used to those tiny little vegetable peelers that are probably yay thick and they just are they're hard they dig into your hand they dig into your palm they're always really awkward um, and this is actually an OXO brand here that I have posted nice big handle easy to hold on to we can push through with enough force to get that's a heavy task uh, if cooking is a valued leisure activity of yours and peeling vegetables and peeling potatoes is just a pain literally this is a really good alternative piece of adaptive equipment where we can really get a firm grip. The handle is comfortable. I think it's silicone or rubber as a lot of their stuff. And you can really get in and put a lot of force through the device and not worry about it bending. That's the other thing with those metal ones. They always seem to bend or maybe I was just doing it wrong. I don't know. Um, the one next to it, that vegetable chopper, again, really easy. Knife skills, and we're gonna talk about this more, really hard on our hands. And so if you can just push down with both hands on an onion or a carrot or celery to have it just finely chop or dice for you, really easy workaround, saves a lot of time, saves the hands, preserves them so they can do other stuff throughout the day rather than worrying about having to chop and prepare a meal at the end of the day. Um, the garlic press is another great one. And I know that they have those pre-minced garlics now in those big jars, which is a great, that's a great alternative too. If you like fresh garlic, all you have to do is take the clove out of this. This one is easy using two hands to just push together and you have fresh minced garlic right on your own. So that's just preferential, but that's a great workaround as well. 
Uh, I want to point out the jar opener. Both of those items on the bottom right, OXO, really good brand. Um, this jar opener, it's, it's great because it gives you a lever. So not only does it hang onto the lid for you, but when we talk about using larger muscles and larger joints, it has a lever so you can use your shoulder, you can use your elbow to push on that jar to open it rather than relying on the hand and the fingers or the wrist and the fingers to twist in that awkward and really intense position. Um, East Special Needs, this bottom right, uh, I mean, bottom center picture with the shoelaces, that's for e special needs. And I like that because sometimes shoelace tying, especially if the hands are um, suffering from a significant amount of arthritis or there's just stiffness, these uh, shoelaces are great because they just clip and unclip. All you have to do is push them together, I'm pushing to take them apart. So you don't have to worry about tying laces and, and trying to manage the manipulation and fine motor control. And then the one that I really, really like is this vertical knife just to the left of those shoelaces at the bottom. Again, that knife cutting, that rocking is a lot of awkward. You can see wrist motion, finger motion, and you're trying to crunch and push. And sometimes, depending on how you like your steak or whatever it is you're trying to cut, that's really intense. So I like what, I believe this is OXO as well. And I like what they've done is that they've made that handle vertical so we get a better grip. And then we're again using, we're sawing, using larger muscles, larger joints to cut through our food. Super effective, really saves the hands and it completely changes the way uh, that you go about meal times. If that's something that's really, really difficult and painful for you. This, I just wanted to give a quick plug. I was, <clears throat> Uh, informed about this book from a patient a couple of years ago, and um, she actually had tennis elbow, and she brought this book in. She was getting ready to discharge, and she was like, I have this great book that I want to talk to you about. It talks about knitting, needling, quilting, all kinds of crafting, and it puts it in an ergonomic uh, lens. I think she even says that somewhere in there, it, it tells you how to do it one-handed in an ergonomic way to save your hands. So she was really, really excited about it. Um, I've referred it to people since then and they've come back and really loved it. So if this is a valued uh, pastime of yours, crafting, needling, knitting, uh, this seems to be a really good resource if you're struggling with that and wanna try some other conservative at home trends before giving therapy a shot. So I highly recommend this book. So I wanna, I wanna talk a little bit about and give some visuals um, to what it is exactly I'm talking about. That's the perk of having uh, kind of one-on-one -on -one time with my patients is that we can sit down and really practice and get an idea for what these things look like because it is different. It's simple, but it's different. And so here are some visuals. We'll kind of break down what it is that I'm talking about. The left upper hand picture is showing this kind of right, this kind of like key pinch between our thumb and our pointer finger. Uh, that's probably one of the worst positions that we can repetitively put ourselves through day to day. So we know that a pound of force at the tip of our thumb here translates to 24 pounds of force at the bottom of our uh, of our thumb at that CMC joint. That's an area where most all of us will develop arthritis in that area just because of how we use our hands ineffectively day in and day out. So usually when people come in and we're taking our measurements and we're seeing where people are, most people usually pinch, lateral pinch with about 10 pounds of force on average, I would say. And so if you think about that, that's 10 pounds of force at the tip of our thumb here, that's translating down here at about 240 pounds of force at the base of our thumb to a tiny, tiny little joint that's not supposed to take that kind of amount of force every day. And 10, 10 pounds isn't really that much when you think about I'm carrying a plate and it's in this tip pinch or I'm pulling the sheets on my bed or whatever it might be, we do it more often than we think. So instead of having that tip pinch in this awkward position here, we want to get a full grip. That's this middle picture on the top. So we're getting our power grip around whatever device it is that we're trying to work with. Um, really important, recruiting bigger muscles, using more of our full fist or full hand than relying on our, our thumb to do the bulk of that work for us. And I like the picture to the right of it even better because although the middle picture is great and it's showing a power grip, 
uh, the one on the right is showing up that built up handle. So we have some extra support and we're able to generate more force with that thicker handle. So oftentimes when we're talking about force production with things, if we're too small, we have our muscles are, are pulling on a really inefficient position. And if it's too big, that's equally as disadvantageous. So we're not able to pull enough on our muscles. So there's a happy medium when we're talking about force production. And for our hands, this is a really great position to talk about a built up handle. We can really keep a good grip on it and it's much easier to work with. Uh, so then now moving down below, looking at that palm up or palm in, uh, lifting, handling, pushing, pulling. Uh, the, this fella on the left here, uh, I know that these are all weight exercises, but it really does demonstrate the, the positions that I'm wanting to highlight. And the one on the left, we can see his palms facing down toward the ground. I challenge you to think about and to pay attention over the next little while, how often you pick up a cup that way, how often you pick up your phone, or how often maybe a suitcase or a backpack or a purse. Almost everybody that comes into me, I, I kind of watch them as they gather their belongings to come back and have our evaluation. Almost everybody reaches for that thing and picks up like this. Well, the problem is that these tissues on the back of our forearm, our wrist extensors, aren't made to produce that kind of amount of force and, and with that kind of repetition. So it's really hard on our hands, but then if we constantly are operating in this palm down posturing and positioning, we start to see things like Decker veins, ten tenosynovitis along our thumb. We start to see things like tennis elbow, golfer's elbow, things that with repetitive micro traumas irritates the elbow and the hand um, so instead, we move over to the palms up and palms in position, right? So that middle, that middle photo is showing that those palms up. Immediately, you're engaging your biceps, those big, strong elbow flexors, and now they're taking the brunt of that force, the brunt of that load, instead of our wrist and finger uh, soft tissues and joints. And then same thing for the fella on the right, the bottom right, has those palms in, thumbs up to the ceiling, engaging brachialis, brachioradialis, bigger muscles, much more capable of handling those things than our fingers, wrists, and hands. The other thing that I want to note is that when we're doing this, we still want to try and keep our wrists neutral, right? So neutral here, trying to not carry things in a flexed position, in an awkward position, or carry things in a wrist back position, or side to side. We want to have our wrists nice and neutral, nice and neutral, evenly balanced, evenly distributing the load and the pressure through our arm. This is a big one. This one, this one gets me, and and I I definitely heed my own advice with eggs or or whisking or beating or mixing something. Very very awkward posture, right? If you look at your hands and you make just a fist, our fingers naturally kind of want to come to our thumb side, but when we whisk, everything wants to be pulled to our pinky side of our hand, and that really stretches and stresses the ligaments in our fingers, and it crunches on the soft tissues. It's just really awkward. And then you add that wrist motion, and that's really intense for our hands to be able to handle, depending on how much you're doing it during the week. So uh, our, our alternative is this picture to the right. And I love this picture too, because automatically we have our power grip. We're using bigger muscles, bigger joints. It also has a built, the handle is much larger on this whisk than it is on the one on the left. So it's easier to get around. We're using bigger muscles and bigger joints to whisk and to mix much easier and saves our hands for other tasks to do during the day. Um, my workaround, I have a blender bottle. I just put my eggs in that and I shake it, shake it, shake it. And that just whisks it for me. So that's, that's how I, I eat eggs every day. So I don't even, I don't whisk them anymore, but that's my workaround. Uh, the bottom left is another one that gets a lot of people, um, skillets, uh, cooking on the stove top and moving skillets, dumping skillets, straining, stuff like that. When we hold the skillet, you can even see it in that picture there, kind of falls to the to this pinky side of our wrist where right? we get this awkward wrist posture and then all of a sudden the handle is being supported in that tip pinch by our thumb again one of the things you don't think of it but it's happening all of the time and you're not even aware of it so instead of holding the skillet in this awkward and demanding posture we flip our grip and with that handle we want our palm up this happy fella on the right bottom corner he's pretty stoked and he's doing it right and so 
we have our handle, we've got our palm up to the ceiling, automatically we have our biceps engaged, we have a neutral wrist. If it's a cast iron, specifically two hands, always better than one, uh, but throw on uh, an oven mitt, carry it with two hands, one palm in, hanging on to the outside of the skillet, the other palm up, hanging on to the handle, much easier, much more effective. We're dispersing all of that force and all of that load to both of our arms. And it's still easy to drain or whisk or, or move, you know, get, getting stuff out of the skillet or the cast iron, whatever it is. It's still pretty easy with that palm up position. It feels a little bit awkward at first because we never do that. I, this is one that I still kind of do myself just because it's easier, it's faster, just as that's the handle, I'm gonna pick it up. But when it's painful and when it's uh, taking us out of other things in the evening that we want to be able to do, it is worth experimenting with just to try different hand placements and different usages of the hands for meal prep activities. This, uh, this one is a big one. We all do this one. We all carry our grocery bags at the hook of our hand. We have it kind of dangling here in our fingertips. Um, with that repetitive micro trauma to that part of our fingers and over a long period of time, that's when we start to see things like trigger finger uh, start to accumulate and to build because those tiny, tiny insults to the soft tissues, to the flexor tendons of our fingers, our body's gonna lay down tissue in response to that just to buffer it because it's always being irritated. So what happens is we start to build balls of adhesion on the flexor tendons of our fingers when we carry things like this habitually and forever, right? And so those balls of adhesions uh, get bigger and bigger and then eventually they start getting stuck and then we can't get our finger up out of our palm. We have to pull it finally, right? And that just makes the problem worse. So instead of um, asking too much of the soft tissues and of the joints of our fingers, of our hands by carrying grocery bags or suitcases, again, briefcases, backpacks, purses this way, we have three different alternatives. So the top one there, uh, this guy is doing it exactly right. He's got his palms up or palms in. I don't know if he's using both arms or not, but he's a pretty big guy. But either way, he's got his palms up and in. He's transferring all of that load to the biceps, to the elbow, to the shoulder. He's got an open hand. He's not working too hard there. Much easier, much more uh, beneficial way to carry bigger groceries than in the hook of our hand there. Um, the one in the middle on the far right there, I do this one because my grocery store never has any uh, grocery carts. All it has is baskets. And it's not as taxing or exhausting as you would think that it would be to carry it on the forearm. And for short periods of time, this is okay. Um, yes, there are some sensitive structures up on the forearm and close to the elbow, but we're not carrying a basket for, you know, forever and hopefully not going to the grocery store a ton during the week. Um, but this is much easier way to carry some of those baskets or bags or purses or whatever it might be, putting it on a larger surface. And then at the bottom, this one's great too, because not only is she carrying the, the bags on her shoulder and using her shoulder to take the brunt of that weight, but then she's got both of her hands available to get into her car to mess with the doorknob. So not only is it saving some of the, not only are some of these strategies saving our hands from injury or chronic injury, but it, it frees us up to be functional too, in case we have to work with something outside of us, whether it's the doorknob, a car key, what, what have you. And then we'll talk about some TLC. So I'm a big fan of heat. I think heat is great. I, I like heat, but I have folks who come in who like ice. Um, I don't hate ice. I'm not gonna tell people to not ice. Uh, if ice is something that you like and something that works for you, I would say heat first, ice after. The reason for that being is that we know that ice is uh, on such a shallow area like our hands, if you think about going outside on a day like today, it's very snowy, it's very, very cold, and you're trying to fiddle with keys or you're trying to mess with your phone or text or something, fine motor, you notice that your hands are quite stiff and they don't move so well. So ice is, it makes tissue less elastic. It slows down how fast our nerves conduct. It pinches those blood vessels. So it's preventing blood. It's obviously when it's cold outside, it's pushing blood to our core to keep us warm, um, but it limits the amount of nutrients and healing properties that are naturally found in blood. 
from getting to those tissues. So um, I like heat because heat essentially does the opposite of all of those things, right? It opens up those blood vessels. We get more blood. We get more healing opportunities to those tissues. It makes the tissue a little bit more elastic and it, uh, it makes the tissue more, just more workable. Um, so when, if people are particularly achy or sore on any given day, um, I usually say heat, heat is great five, 10, maybe 15 minutes, depending on whether it's a plug-in hot pack or hot pad. If it's one of those rice bags that you microwave in the, uh, in the microwave, or some people have paraffin, which is the picture that's shown here, the wax on the hands. Those are all great things to do as just some of the feel goods. Um, so if you're about, but if you like ice and you're about to do something that's a little bit uh, more taxing or demanding, I would say heat five, 10, 15 minutes before you do that activity and then ice after if it's really sore, really achy or painful. So that's my two cents, but everyone, everyone has their beliefs about ice. Um, compression gloves are another great thing that people can use. Those, of course, stimulate a different kind of nerve fiber that transmit faster than our pain fibers. Pain fibers travel very slowly. So if the hands are particularly sore or achy, throwing on a compression glove, um, oftentimes at night, because it's going to keep us from clenching at night, which we all want to do, um, we can put on some compression gloves, whether it's the copper-lined ones, isotoner gloves. Uh, everyone has their preference for them and I whatever works best I say go for it but my warning is that to be leery don't put on something that's too tight make sure that you can tolerate it for several hours during the day before you commit to seven to eight hours at night so that you're not waking up at 3 a.m trying to rip something off your hand because the it's, it's, uh, you know, shut off all of your circulation and the hand is numb and painful. So we don't want that to happen either. And then finally rollouts, the bottom right hand picture is the best example that I could find for this, but I, I'll often tell people truly go find your rolling pin if you have one and just roll out the hand, um, like you would foam roll any other part of your body, like your back or something, just rolling the hand over the, that, uh, rolling pin is gentle enough. Another word of caution is our hands are very, very shallow. There's not a lot here to really have to mess with. And there's a lot of sensitive structures. So sometimes I give people self-massage tasks or something at home and they come in and they're like, I'm going really hard and my hands are really sore. Well, this is a tiny, tiny, tiny little muscle. There's not a lot of tissue here to protect us in our hands. So it's not like a trap or our back or shoulders. It's not like a quad where we're trying to massage. It's going to be gentle, but the, but the gentle firmness that you're going to get from some of these is going to be still just as beneficial. You don't have to dig in very aggressively to get good results in our hands. And same for our elbows and our forearms, same thing. Um, so really quick plug for me, what does hand therapy do for this kind of thing? So our goal ultimately is to improve your daily function and, and performance and anything it is that you want to do. So I'm an occupational therapist. Like I said, for us, occupation is anything that occupies your time during the day. So that doesn't necessarily mean your job. That, mean, that just means anything that you do in a day that is meaningful to you. So that could be crafting. It could be be uh, playing cards. It could be just simply getting ready, self-care, right? That's a, that's a daily occupation that we all have. So our goal is to improve how well you're able to do all of those daily things without any pain and without any limitation. And we do that by looking at motion and hand posture. So um, oftentimes with arthritis and other soft tissue disorders, our, our range of motion is limited and we're not able to get as much as we once were. So we work really hard to free up as much motion as we can, again, without pain, and to improve our hand posture. Sometimes with arthritis, the thumb really closes in on that web space. Sometimes it falls forward. And so we say, okay, well, how can we position you better to make you more effective, to help the hand feel better and move better during daily activity? We also look at things like strength and stabilization in the hand and in the thumb specifically, building strength, um, 
is a huge part of what we do. People don't oftentimes think of sta uh, stability in the hand because it's such a small thing, but sometimes we are too mobile in the hand. And so we start to think, okay, well, how can we stabilize the structures around maybe the bottom of our thumb to make sure that we're not getting that subluxation that's gonna lead to things like CMC arthritis or you know, people who are really hypermobile and they their fingers can do all those fun things. Well, how do we avoid that? Because that's not great, you know, stiffness is bad, but so is too much motion. And so we start to look at how can we be stable in a shorter range of motion and still be strong uh, to, to make everyday function and participation easier. And the other thing that we do is all the fun stuff. So making these custom made splints that you kind of see on the right two pictures. Um, the upper one definitely wouldn't be made for arthritis because it goes onto the forearm, but maybe uh, Decker veins for that tenosynovitis. Um, but we make custom splints and there's a lot of good research to say that for arthritis specifically, uh, therapy in combination with some sort of splinting or bracing is just as effective as surgical outcomes. Um, so we do a, a large amount of stuff all at once and bit by bit, we get you back to doing all the things that you want to do. So that is, that is it. We're just about 35 minutes. Uh, I want to thank everybody for participating. We're going to look at what questions we have really quick here. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Do this. All right, circuit. Let's see. I'll, I'll read them out loud. Just so I, I'm not sure if everyone can see or can find where the q and is. So I'll just read them out loud here really quick. Um, this question says, the circuit weight machines at the Y seem to need palms down for pulling and pushing like a row machine. Should I try to modify that so that the palms are up and in rather than down? Um, I would say, yeah, if you can. So usually at, at like your regular gym, they have those bars that you're pulling like so. Um, but they also have different attachments with the carabiner. So if you can find one that's like, it's like an A and you can pull this way, or they have other ones that are bigger, or you can, with the bar, you can pull with the palms up. So yeah, especially if you have things like tendonitis, um, whether it's tennis elbow, golfer's elbow, and that palms down is really hard. Think about using more of that palms in or that palms up, that'll make it a little bit easier for you. So look and see what availability the gym has, what kind of adaptive equipment, or not adaptive equipment, but different uh, hookups they have for those kinds of things. Uh, talk a bit about elbow pain radiating into the fingers triggered by arm being bent too long in one position. Um, yeah, so that definitely sounds like um, some nervy type stuff. Uh, if our ulnar nerve is coming in, it depends on the fingers, right? So if it's the pinky and the ring finger, um, that's probably because we're holding a sustained position. Any sustained position is really, really uncomfortable. Um, if it's happening at night, um, I would say you can put uh, some sort of elbow sleeve on or, or something like that to keep you from bending the elbow at night. Um, otherwise, changing positions often and frequently. So switching hands, you know, 30 seconds here, 30 seconds here, if it's specifically phone calls that are getting you. Um, that is definitely something that we can talk more about, but definitely something that is fixable with just some uh, changing of postures and stuff. All right, let's see here. Avoid pain. I have another question here. Avoiding pain with in the palm while cycling. Um, that's another, depending, again, uh, a lot of these will need a little bit of some uh, further evaluation, but palm while cycling, there is a little tunnel in our wrist where our ulnar nerve kind of goes through into the pinky side of our hand. So um, oftentimes, if that's what it is, and I have no idea, but uh, this is what's coming to mind. So if it is maybe some pinching on that nerve, um, they call it cycler's palsy, I believe. Um, there's ways that we can pad that part of the hand, um, maybe modify the grip a little bit. Um, I've treated uh, professional cyclists in the past where we've made splints and we've had them just bring their bike in in a way that we can mold the splint to a position that works for them while still protecting the hand. So um, that's what comes to mind. It, it just kind of depends on how you are 
uh, seeing or using cycling and how often and stuff like that. Gardening shears. Um, this is another one, uh, either building up a handle or using two hands to use those shears. It depends on how big the shears are. I'm thinking of like big, big ones, but if they're smaller, um, having the palm in, right, or having the, the shears come out this way, so they're this way, this way. So using a grip like this rather than shearing like this, that's a great, I think, alternative way of doing some of that stuff. Um, do exercises with those Swedish rubber or silicone eggs help? Um, again, kind of tough to say. It depends. I would say if we're if we're talking about arthritis and and stiffness in the fingers, sometimes a really great alternative is just getting a tennis ball. The tennis ball keeps you in an optimal position, in this spherical position here, and it's much easier to generate optimal amounts of force against something. It's not going to move, and it doesn't have to. But that's kind of nice because you can squeeze as hard as you possibly want to. It's not going to go anywhere. So you can generate a large amount of force. If you hold that for five seconds, uh, you start to work on some endurance. So sometimes those isometric exercises are gentler and just as effective, meaning you're not getting any motion. The eggs, I'm not exactly sure what you're talking about, but they, they sound like they maybe squish. If they don't squish, I don't see anything wrong with it. If they squish and it's painful, go to something bigger, something that's not going to move on you. Uh, let's see. The thumb hurts when cycling. Uh, yeah, I mean, for, for me, I'd, I'd kind of have to see the setup of that and see how, if it's this kind of posture, this kind of posture, um, and where on the thumb. There's a lot of sensitive structures around the thumb, including a sensory branch of one of our nerves, a particular carpal bone that can get really irritated. So um, I would say it would need further examination, <laughs> evaluation for that. I, I, I don't have a great answer for that one right now. Um, let's see. Any suggestions on how to use pliers or a wrench to minimize aching fingers? Um, kind of depends on the task. I would say if it's a really heavy task, starting the day with those more demanding tasks are always better. So we talk about energy conservation and going to the, the harder, more demanding activities first, and then maybe saving the things that aren't as important or aren't, aren't as irritating to the hands toward the end. Um, so that's, that's my, that's my best without seeing kind of what it is that you're doing and uh, how often and stuff like that. Uh, to lessen my fingers, hands numbing at night. So it depends on the fingers, but oftentimes if it's night, if it's nice up, we all kind of curl like this at night, right? Look, we all like to snuggle up, especially on a night like tonight, we're all gonna be bundled here. This really closes off our carpal tunnel. If it's coming into these three fingers, the thumb, middle and pointer finger. Um, getting an over-the-counter wrist brace will keep that carpal tunnel open at night, something with a stay. Don't include the thumb. The thumb should be kind of open. So that's something to think about to keep the wrists open at night, and that should help with the numbness and stuff at night. If I sleep on my right side, my left hand goes numb. This started after right shoulder surgery. Um, it could, again, maybe it could be the posture that you're sleeping in at night. We all do funny, funky things. We end up up here. So depending on where the numbness is, it could just be a posturing thing at night. Um, try the over-the-counter wrist braces, like I, I, like I was just mentioning, to keep the wrist open and straight at night. If you've tried that and maybe it's these fingers going numb at night, try something at night, wrapping, a, like roll up a washcloth or a towel, a small towel, and then ace bandage it around your arm. Sometimes when we bend our arm for too long here, we crush that ulnar nerve and we get that sensation to our pinky and ring fingers. So you can try that at night as well. Uh, elbow hurts bent at the computer desk, what do I do? Um, so they used to say 90, 90, 90 with everything. Um, and now we say kind of open up, open up the elbows, the wrists and the hands a little bit. If it's, if it's a work thing, ask for an ergonomic assessment just to be safe. Um, but if your elbow is bent at exactly 90 degrees, try and scoot back, lower the, the keyboard just a little bit to 
uh, almost straighten the elbow a little bit more and that'll unhinge that nerve um, there at the elbow coming down into the hand. Any recommendations for hand weights to use during water aerobics? Normal barbells are so painful to grip. Mm, that's a good one. Um, the, the water aerobics barbell, I'll have to look into that one. At the moment, I don't have the greatest uh, advice for that one. So let me look into that one. The, the kitchen tool pictured instead of a whisk, I think it was an actual whisk. I just think it was a larger one with a larger handle. So a, a whisk would still be good. Um, just make sure that it has a nice big handle for you to use. And OXO definitely has a whisk for that. So if you're looking for any specific brand, they're pretty affordable. Uh, let's see, I have a door handle latch that requires using a finger to press the latch. Oh yeah, ooh, that's a tricky one. So um, if you have two hands available for the door handle latch that requires two fingers to press, if it's what I'm thinking of, and it's like a this that you have to open, or pull, um, try one hand, use the other hand to push down. Two hands are better than one. So if that is really painful, because that would be very difficult, yes. Or if there's some way to grasp around the handle and the latch at the same time and just approximate the two, basically, you could give that a shot as well. Um, Two-handed backhand. I've used one hand for the last 65 years. Two-handed back hand. I'm not sure what that one is. I'll have to get some clarification on that last question there. Um, where the wrist braces, uh, where to purchase those? Amazon or Q, uh, Q whatever uh, the, I'm drawing a blank on it at the moment. Um, but Amazon is a great source. You can just Google it. Uh, if you just if you type in wrist cock up brace, it'll it'll bring it up. Some of them come up onto the thumb, but if it's just for the numbness and stuff, we don't need to worry about that. So if it's numbness, carpal tunnel type stuff, don't worry about that. Um, for tennis, two handed or one handed, that that is a good for the tennis. I am getting back to the backhanded question here, backhand question for tennis. Um, uh, I would try to. I'm not as I'm not as familiar with tennis, um, and that tennis elbow is a lot. If you could somehow maybe just even stabilize the wrist, if you taped your wrist a little bit, that would give you a little bit of some stability while still giving you some motion. So um, that might be a good workaround too. If two-handed backhand is really difficult or awkward, try taping the wrist. Uh, hand therapy can. Depending on what it is, I'm not going to make too many promises. Definitely help a finger that locks up. Um, depending on how severe it is, how long it's been going on, it's always a good idea to consult with the doc just to get x-rays and see what exactly is happening in there. But um, but it's that it could absolutely be worth a hand therapy evaluation as well for those locking fingers. Um, can occupational therapists make a diagnosis for wrist pain? So no, I can't make a diagnosis. Um, I can't diagnose as an OT. I can formulate my own idea and in collaboration with the doctor with imaging and other uh, assessment tools, we can make a firm diagnosis, but I can't, I can't, I cannot make a diagnosis. Ice or heat for elbow pain. Um, it depends. There are a couple of sensitive nerves up in the elbow. So if it is on the inside here, I would not ice that area just because that nerve is so superficial. You can burn that nerve if we're not careful. So I would say heat, um, but experiment with both and see what works best for you. Any food recommendation for foods that avoid arthritis sufferers? Um, uh, especially with RA, that is uh, linked to high stress levels. So any sort of stress management or anti-inflammatory diet that you know of that you can kind of work on. I won't make any formal recommendations, but uh, folks who usually do any sort of that through their own uh, research that have done an anti-inflammatory diet, that, that does help. And stress management does help as well. There is a connection, mind-body connection to a lot of that. So um, managing stress, putting good foods into our bodies that aren't going to flare up our joints and muscles always is a good idea. 
There's also a selection of decent wrist braces at CVS. That's what I was trying to think of. Yes, Walgreens and CVS uh, uh, and grocery stores will have some of those things as well. So I think that is the last of our questions. Thank you again so much for coming. This was awesome and for participating. Really great questions. Um, like I said, phone number at the beginning for scheduling for member OT. And I appreciate it. Thank you everybody so much. Have a great rest of your day.